My name is Drew Doucette, and I'm the lead mentor here uh, for Art Lab Plus at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. I'm here with LA-based artist Kim Schoenstatt. She's here for a Meet the Artist, which is going to be happening tonight, and then we'll also be teaching a master class, which is happening uh, this Saturday coming up. Kim, are you excited for tonight? I am. I am. I'm always excited to speak about my work. And, and I'm actually, you know, I was just telling Caroline, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the master class because that's really when you get to work with other artists and you get to sort of get to know other people and what they're working on and, mm -hmm. and to really kind of exchange ideas. Right, right. So first question is, uh, is there anything outside of the art world that is influencing your work now? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of being an artist is that you're not so, your focus isn't necessarily very narrow, that you get to do all this research. And there's basically sort of two sort of side tangents that I'm kind of obsessed with. Mm -hmm. um, some of them actually came out of my Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd done a fair amount of research actually over at Air and Space as well as the American History Museum. And w one of the things that I found fascinating at Air and Space was the parachutes that mm -hmm. got the capsules down from outer space. Right. Right. It's like a, it's like a really hard thing to get these people up into space. And the thing that brings them down safely is probably the oldest technology <laughs> around, which is a parachute and mm -hmm. drag. And it was fascinating because so many other artifacts are preserved so beautifully and the parachutes are just shoved into crates and boxes and they're, mm -hmm. they're the most important aspect of the whole mission and yet they have this sort of patheticness in the archive. And I, I kind of really dug that. But, right. um, and they're just beautiful objects. Um, and then the other sort of side tangents that I'm always fascinated with is um, the, I'm, I'm really interested in science. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in all of how we understand the world and these different theories of understanding the world. So like um, String theory is mm. one of them, and then the multiple worlds theory is another one. And there's all these sort of odd theories out there trying to explain the way that the world works. And I, I find them really fascinating. Right. You mentioned yesterday a little bit how um, just like all these different realities or these different worlds, uh, depending on decisions that get made. Yeah, that's right. um, Everett's world, multiple worlds theory. Right. right. And it, it's a crack up. I mean, it's really, it's a, it's, it's a legitimate theory. I mean, there's scientific mm -hmm. basis. He used quantum mechanics to prove his theory. It's, it's fascinating. And yet it seems so foreign to us and I mean, to me in terms of sort of reality. And the concept is that, you know, for every one decision, you, there are multiple outcomes. So I could have answered your question in six different ways just now. Right. And the theory says that I did and all of those are existing and so all of these different tangents of reality all exist at the same time mm -hmm. and this sounds really fancy and, and floozy manuli but um, I, I kind of got interested in that when I was doing research for this uh, work that I did at the LA Louvre Gallery this mm -hmm. past summer and I was researching it was really one of the first big projects in LA that I had done in a long time and I was researching unrealized architecture in LA Mm -hmm. And I realized that, like the multiple worlds theory, there could have been all these different Los Angeleses. Like, there could have been a Rem Cool House house on the Venice Canals, mm -hmm. but there isn't. Right. There could have been, you know, all of these other houses all over LA, and they still exist in theory on paper and could exist if somebody wanted to make them happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example of an my sort of wandering mind. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and that just, that ties in directly to your work, like just seeing uh, how you put these lines together with, through architecture and, and you're kind of this what if, like what if, you know, um, gravity was different and we didn't need to have well, that structure. And that's the beauty of art is right. that, you know, in art you don't have to pay attention to gravity and mm -hmm. physics and things like that. Like right. you can, you can do that with art because you can make the impossible possible because it doesn't have to actually exist. Right, right. So um, next question would be, uh, what's inspiring your move from 2D to 3D? Um, 
I've struggled with this for a long time. And uh, actually, in preparation for my lecture, I, I was sort of having a walk back through my work. And I realized that I've been working on this problem for like 14 years. And it started with, instead of coming out from the wall, actually cutting into the wall. My earliest sort of wall pieces actually cut straight into the wall. I used a hand drill, and I drilled the drawing in. And then what actually sat on top was just surface. It was just it was either graphite or paint mm -hmm. or um, you know crepas, whatever. Um, and I've been really struggling with how does a wall drawing exist on the wall, and can I pull it off the wall? Mm -hmm. And so that was really the impetus: is really wanting to come off the wall. Um, I love making site-specific installations. I love that they're. Um, I love the how temporary they are. Yeah. That you know, basically, what you're left with to store is a set of instructions. Mm -hmm. And I also like that you don't need me for that. Right. Like anybody, if you have the instructions, if you follow the instructions, anybody can do one of my wall drawings. And that's been kind of one of my conceptual struggles with it: is that an actual object, if something happens to the object, you need the artist. Right. You don't have the instructions. So I'm actually trying to work that out, is um, how do I leave these sort of plans mm -hmm. for the work, for the sort of moment when something happens, or it can't be shipped, or something, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Um, moving over to technology, uh, what types of technology are you using for your work, and how has that influenced your work? Like, has it changed it at all over the years? Um, through just computers and, and you know them being a lot faster and being yeah. able to do a lot of different things now. So just how has that changed your work, if it has at all? Well, I mean, technology is a tool like any other. And so when I first started making these drawings, I used a just good old-fashioned light table, and I had transparencies, and that was sort of the mode of operation. Um, and then... Transparency started as Photoshop got better, transparencies got more expensive. And then the, also the ease of just being able to use Photoshop and to make the layers and then to use that program um, to really work out the composition mm -hmm. really started working for me. Um, it, was a, it was a transition though. So yeah. you had to sort of make your choices as to, you know, and, and I had to retrain my brain, basically, as to how do I see this? Can I see it in, on the light table as easily as I can see it on Photoshop? Mm -hmm. And it, it, was a, it was a couple year process. Wow. The 3D work, so I have to use a 3D modeling program to yeah. do it because I'm not a sculptor. My husband can make all these sketches and he can see it, and, mm -hmm. and these, but he's a sculptor. And so coming from painting and drawing where, you know, my mind isn't necessarily trained to think vi um, in dimensions, mm -hmm. I have to use the modeling program. And, you know, my sort of geeky side really enjoys that. I, it's a really good tool. And I, I, I don't use a complicated one. I use Google Sketchup. It's right. the dumbest one out there, <laughs> but it works. It, it really does work. We, <laughs> it we actually well. teach that in the art lab to the teens, and it's a, they can pick it up so easily. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and some like some of them now are working on trying to, w along with one of our mentors, um, develop the museum and like actually in Google SketchUp create. If they like, could realize the galleries as well, because I've realized that I was that's part of the plan. Yeah, because yeah. that's that was the part that I was like I was studying the um, the galleries and I was studying, mm -hmm. you know, parts for different projects and and just my own sort of creative output and. Mm -hmm. Google SketchUp, they have the exterior, like on, but they don't have the inside. And right. I really wanted, I'm kind of obsessed with the lobby, and I kind of mm -hmm. wanted a more understanding of the lobby. And right, right. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you, if we make it over to the art lab, I'll show you today. Cool. Um, and then so last is just, once you finish up with the programs here at the Hirshhorn, the Meet the Artist and the Masterclass, what's next for you? Do you have any projects coming up that you're excited about? or? 
you know? You know, I, I do. I, I don't want to sort of, I don't want to jinx it. There are a couple, okay. there are a couple really cool projects coming up. Mm -hmm. And one may involve an indoor-outdoor element. And so going from an exterior sculpture garden into an interior gallery. Oh, cool. And I've been, and this is definitely where the 3D modeling is going to come in. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it. We, we're still negotiating a bunch of stuff, so. Okay. All right, cool. Well, thanks for your time, Kim. Thanks, and, Drew. Yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight. Me too. All right. <laughs>